Hello and welcome to the third episode of our Victor Posmore Gallery Virtual Visits. In this series of short episodes, we will explore different angles to the 20th century artist Victor Posmore, making the gallery as accessible as possible, especially during this time when the gallery remains temporarily closed. Well, in this episode, we will continue to unpack what Posmore intended by the term the independence of painting, but especially in light to his own artistic motto of constructing from within. In fact, let's begin from a place of doubt. Is such a thing as the independence of painting even possible? Well, a Posmore tirelessly asked this question too, and sought to find out whether painting could indeed be free and independent, when it is so much bound to a surface. Well, in search for some kind of answer, he committed himself to his studio-turned-research lab to develop a so-called independent morphology a kind of visual language, if you will, that would be appropriate, and I quote Posmore here, to both painting and sculpture. This meant changing the process of painting from one of visual abstraction to that of intrinsic and organic construction. Well, this was precisely at the beginning and at the core of Posmore's long quest in exploring the relation between form, space, and ultimately humanity. That's right, humanity. Man, the individual, people, society. First came the abandonment of the paintbrush. And this made room, literally, for the use of the paper collage technique, as we see in the works of, uh, of early cubists, for example. The concrete surface, Posmore explains, led to the notion of constructing a picture like a carpenter constructs a box with wood, saw, hammer, and nails. Eventually, this collage developed almost naturally into a relief and three-dimensional installations. Well, in the gallery we do have some examples of these relief projections, uh, one of which you see right now on your screen called Projecting Image in White, Black and Umber, and there are of course others as well. But this experimentation in relief work, coupled with that continued investigation into the independence of painting, inevitably raised questions about the very nature of painting itself and how it relates to space. We could ask the question, for example, if the impact of natural objects depends on the space that it occupies, then shouldn't this also be the case for painting? Well, to that question, Posmore might answer with another question. Did not the naturalist, and one might add classical here, did not the naturalist tradition use perspective in order to produce an illusion of space and solidity? Painting alone, according to this reasoning, could not provide the conditions necessary for complete independence unless combined with sculpture or architecture. But after more than a decade of creating relief projections, there came a point where the surface projections could not be extended further. And the next step would have to consider objects that could stand alone, freestanding sculpture or architecture. Well, a rare opportunity to test this out presented itself soon after when in 1955 Posmer was appointed as a consulting director of architectural design for Peterly Newtown in County Durham. For it, he proposed laying out and linking, linking individual housing units by these meandering pathways and especially through a monumental central public sculpture the Apollo Pavilion, named after the recent space, Apollo space mission and moon landings. Well, this pavilion would also serve as a bridge between the two parts of the housing estate. Indeed, the pavilion was intended as an emotional centre, a parallel to, say, cathedrals and churches that occupy the heart of the city, and of which Posmer had plenty to refer to as he was living on the island. 
But even then, Posmore comes to the realization that the same physical limitations of painting haunt sculpture and architecture too, and that this limit also restricts the architect from reaching an architectural idea and from giving it a physical form. So there is yet another shared factor. The experience of a physical reality or a limit in this case is a subjective one. It cannot be measured in the same way space or form are measured. And this is where we, the viewers, participants or occupants, come in. In classical naturalism, the, the spectator was always at a distance from the, the work. The work was something which operated partly or mostly in his imagination. But in this new approach, the work of art is an actual object. And the spectator can get a, a new dimension uh, by actually feeling the work, handling it, and if it were large enough, he could get into it. And that was a short clip from the documentary the Artist Speaks, produced in 1951. But indeed, where we stand or move about in relation to a work, how we look from within or from without, how we interact or react or don't, all are an extension of that work, which is determined not by the physical limit of the work, as much as it is determined by who we are, by time, chance, reason, intellect, emotion, impulses, and memories buried deep within. Well, just as it was for his own residence in Dar Jamri in Gudia, or the plan for Peterly Newtown, and of course the Apollo Pavilion, all were approached with the same sensibility. This was intended, quoting Posmore here, as an architecture and sculpture of purely abstract form, through which to walk, in which to linger, and on which to play, a free and anonymous monument, which, because of its independence, can lift the activity and psychology of an urban housing on a universal plan. The Apollo Pavilion, an apt name indeed, isn't it? But human interactions go both ways, don't they? And the cheers that harbored in this new kind of social architecture was quickly met by the jeers of those who had to live with it. What started off as a program to rebuild the community quickly degenerated into a demolition campaign, starting with a call to remove the pavilion altogether, which by the 80s had become this sad, grey and abused ruin. Even then though, with, char with characteristic humour, Posmore's view was one that rested on the dynamic between the art object and the individual. And he says about all this, the sentiment that the graffiti had, if anything, humanized the piece and actually suggested that the solution would not be to remove the piece, but rather the disruptive families abusing it. Ugh, harsh. But in any case, what ultimately mattered for Pasmar was the potential of an objective form becoming something else. The creation then becomes a meeting place of sorts, a dance between the objective and subjective. In nature, so also in art. Reality belongs to the point where subjective and objective processes meet. Quoting Pasmore right there. Well, and since this is beyond the problem of space, exiting the field of construction and entering into the field of consciousness, it is also at this point that Posmore makes a complete U-turn and returns to painting once again. But this return to painting does not end Posmore's preoccupation with construction, with form and space. If anything, it is a sort of absorption of it, a deepening, internalizing it into a constructing from within. Now, to conclude, in Posmore's own words, purely formal painting does make it possible for an integration 
of the painter and the architect. In fact, he tells us the painter is a form of architect. And that brings us to the end of this episode, but we'll continue building on all of this in the forthcoming ones. So until then, stay, stay tuned, stay safe, and thank you for following. <laughs>